Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Deadline for week six of the South Carolina high school football season. We've officially started region play. I want to start out by sending my heartfelt condolences and prayers to the Chesney community. Just an absolutely awful tragedy that struck them yesterday. They had three killed and one injured in a serious car accident, had a fire involved in it yesterday. They ended up having to postpone their game against Landrum. Uh, right now, if that game, it is unclear when or how it will be made up. It's a region game, so one would feel like they do have to reschedule it somehow. But right now, there are things that are just more important than football. This is definitely one of them. Heartfelt condolences and prayers out to all those affected, all the friends and family of those affected out there in the Chesney community and Chesney High School. Jumping right in on what happened this week in region play, starting in 5A, the game of the week, the Burns Rebels and the Spartanburg Vikings. Uh, these two teams, arguably the two of the best defenses around out there. This one had old school football written all over it. You look at the stats coming into this one, Spartanburg's defense had given up an average of just over 10 points in their non-region games. Both of their losses were just by two points. Uh, it was just the offense for Spartanburg has been a bit of a bugaboo for them this year. Uh, they've been averaging just 11 points per game through their non-region schedule, and frankly, those stats are heavily bolstered by beating Riverside and Malden really handily over the last two weeks. So Spartanburg struggling a little bit on offense. And, uh, their defense really solid, so it's Burns. So again, this just had all the shapings of being an old-school, low-scoring football game. Uh, but as it turns out, eh, it's... Spartanburg's de Spartanburg was driving both times, and Burns' defense ended up coming up with two big defensive touchdowns that were the difference in the game. Burns mustered one touchdown on offense. It was from Trey Sagara, the really talented freshman running back. Happened with three minutes to play there in the first quarter, and the rest of their points came on defense. Uh, the first turnover that they forced for touchdown was a screen pass where T.J. Johnson hit Rael Sangor out in the flat. And I Cook basically completely laid the wood on him, lit him up, knocked the ball loose, forced a fumble. And then as the ball got kicked around a little bit, Kanai picks it up and takes it the rest of the way for a scoop and score. Puts the Burns up 14 to nothing at the time. The other one came late in the game. Spartanburg was down just five points. They came all the way back to make it 14 to nine. Late in the game, they're driving. They're down inside the red zone. T.J. Johnson throws a quick strike. Unfortunately, right into the hands of waiting James Oates, the middle linebacker for Burns, took it 80 yards the other way for the game sailing pick six, makes it a final score of 21 to 9 in this one. Truth be told, for Spartanburg going forward, they have one of the best defenses in the state. That defense can really only carry them so far. I mean, the rest of the way in region play, you got to look at their remaining region schedule. They've still got to play Dorman and Gaffney and Boiling Springs. Now, Dorman and Boiling Springs. We'll get to them in a little bit. They still both have really good defenses as well. That's kind of basically the strengths of their team. Obviously, Gaffney is really strong on the defensive side of the ball as well. So it's it's a no-brainer to say that in Region 2-5A, every game, you're going to be facing a really good defense. So your offense has to do a little bit of something because this is not the best region in the state for no particular reason. You're going up against the best of the best week in and week out. So for Spartanburg, the truth of the matter going forward here is if they don't find some consistency on offense, it, they may not win the region like they, may, they were kind of favored to earlier in the season. I mean, at this point, you are what you are. I mean, if you're over halfway through the season, your identity is not going to change much going forward at this point. You are what you are. What they are is a really strong defense and a team that's got some talent on offense. It's just not clicking. It's going to be tough to, for them to try to put that together, looking at what they've got left on their schedule here. So if you were struggling before before coming into region play, you're going to be in trouble going down the road in region 2-5A, and this could be the case for Boiling Springs. Excuse me, for Spartanburg. If you were Spartanburg, then you'll have to you really want to pinpoint a game to circle in the schedule going forward that might help you to improve your seeding going forward, because I think Spartanburg's definitely going to be a playoff team. There's no question about that. But... If you're going to circle a game for the, to solidify better seating on the schedule going forward, it's that Boiling Springs game. For some reason, the Spartanburg Boiling Springs game always has big implications with it. Uh, it's definitely one to circle because it could mean the difference between Spartanburg finishing second and Spartanburg finishing third in the region if they get that win. So that's one to circle on the schedule for the Vikings. But moving forward, 
Spartanburg next week has Gaffney. That's going to be a, another tough one once again. And then Burns will take on Boiling Springs next week. Speaking of Boiling Springs, jumping into what happened last night at Dorman. First off, congratulations to Jake Morris, new head coach at Dorman High School. Remember last week I mentioned that Dorman was in kind of unfamiliar territory because they were looking at potentially not making the playoffs this year, potentially finishing fifth in the region. And yeah, there were just a lot of question marks with them coming into the season. I highlighted this last week. They didn't know, have, know who their starting quarterback was going to be. They didn't know who their running back was going to be. They've been using a stable of running backs throughout the season. That didn't change last night. And they used their third different starting quarterback last night. They gave the nod to Bryce O'Neill to be the starting quarterback for them. But still, none of those questions have been answered. Again, that kind of goes back to what I was saying about Spartanburg. You are what you are at this point. If you're dormant at this point, you just don't have an established running back or an established quarterback. You may have gotten a glimpse into the future last night, and that's a good thing for them, but you still have all of these question marks going forward. But the biggest thing is, last night, you picked up a region win. You can finish no worse than fourth. You're going to make the playoffs. So that 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 in and of itself is huge. You found a way to win a game against, against Boiling Springs that you needed to have. But as far, as far as things went for them last night, they didn't have any more balance on offense, like I said. They found some success by exploiting Boiling Springs' as major weakness. Boiling Springs really struggles to defend against the run along the outside. Clover did that with a lot of success against them last week, even though we kind of credited it at the time to their running back just being that big, that talented, and hard to stop. Dorman used three different running backs against them, and the one that had the most impact, and this is something that's different from the last few weeks for Dorman too. Last few weeks, Dorman's had four different running backs, and None of them over 50 yards in the game. Dorman actually had a rusher over 100 and a rusher over over 50 in this one. They had their leading rusher, Nick Means, the freshman running back. He racked up 116 yards on 21 carries to lead the way. Jarvis Pearson also had 93 yards on 17 carries with a touchdown. That's a far cry from having four different running backs, not even near 50 yards a week ago. So Dorman found some success in the running game. But it's not necessarily an indicator of anything going forward because, again, Boiling Springs just struggles to defend the run on the outside, and that's a lot of what Dorman did last night. They ran a lot of halfback sweeps to the right, and they ran a lot of runs off tackle to the right side. And Boiling Springs just, for whatever reason, could not really defend very well. But looking at Bryce O'Neill's numbers, not the most impressive game for him. His first play from scrimmage for Dorman in this game they threw up a pass in the middle of the field. He ends up throwing a pick six to Boiling Springs. This Amaje Boyd puts Boiling Springs up seven to nothing early. But Bryce O'Neill finished with 32 passing yards, two picks. So no passing game this time and a lot of running game. So again, just no balance on offense for Dorman still. Uh, on the Boiling Springs side of things, Javen Chim was basically made a non-factor in this game. And that's a, a lot of credit to Dorman for executing well in their game plan. Boiling Springs' offense has thrived when Javen Chim's been able to help them balance things out. They just weren't able to do that today. Javen Chim held to just 25 yards on 16 touches. Rashawn Morgan led the way for Boiling Springs. He had 34 yards on five carries. So it was Boiling Springs that was being held to less than 50 rushing yards and two different running backs there. So basically, Boiling Springs was kind of forced to play right into the strength of that Dorman team. All season long, the strength of that Dorman team has proven week in and week out to be their secondary. They did a very good job of covering Boiling Springs. Boiling Springs wasn't able to, able to take a whole lot of deep shots last night. They had to use the middle of the field a lot. And even though Lincoln Husky still had a decent night, they still had minimal success. Lincoln Husky threw for over 200 yards. He didn't have a passing touchdown. Really, most of those 200 yards came on like three plays where Bowling Springs just had one miraculous catch by Javen Chim along the sideline that was tipped. He had another really nice diving snag that was made along the sideline. He had, had about two or three different plays. It went for like 20-plus yards that really contributed to those numbers for Lincoln Husky. So credit to Dorman. They executed really well. They made Bowling Springs play right into their strength, and yeah, it did not go well for them. But in the end, this game really came down to two things. Boulder Springs was leading 10-7 to for most of the game. Dorman faked a 24-yard field goal, which may or may not have just been because of a botched snap. Still don't, not sure about that. I didn't actually see the snap since I was watching from the back of the end zone. But botched snap, either that or just a straight-up fake. 
24 yards out. Bowling Springs snuffed it out, got the ball inside their own 10-yard line with two minutes left in the game. At this point, Bowling Springs is the first down away from making this a different result. You're looking at Bowling Springs winning this one probably 10-7 to if they were able to pick up the first down here. But instead, the Bulldogs decided to try to run between the tackles up the middle on three straight plays. Couldn't even pick up a yard. So they end up having to punt out of the back of their end zone. And when they did, Dorman returned it all the way to the 20-yard line, drove it all the way down to the Bowling Springs, too. And credit to Bowling Springs' defense, they forced this game to come down to a goal line stand. It was fourth and goal from the two. Dorman lines up their five foot seven junior running back, Najee Fowler, who didn't have a touch all game up to this point. And he bowled his way in right behind the right side of the line to give Dorman the lead with 22 seconds left. Now, credit to Boiling Springs. They didn't lie down and give up. They didn't have any timeouts left, but they were able to get the ball to midfield and set up a Hail Mary at the very minimum. They spiked the ball with a, a hundredth of a second left on the clock. Lincoln Husky puts up a 50-yard Hail Mary. Beautiful, beautiful rainbow of a pass. He got it to the end zone. The problem is there were like three Dorman defenders over there with one Boiling Springs receiver. So that pass was picked off in the end zone to end the game. So Dorman ends up stealing a 14-10 win for Boiling Springs to go to 1-0 in region play. Next week, Boiling Springs will be at home again as they will host the Burns Rebels. So that'll be a very tough test for this Boiling Springs team who's now either going to have to get an at-large bid which, by the way, if you do get the at-large bid out of the Upstate and 5A, your first-round opponent in the playoffs will be the Region 2 5A champion. So it doesn't get any easier for you. You've already, you'll have already you have already played them once, and that's about the only advantage you're going to have in this one. Now for Dorman, they will take a step out of region play next week. Dorman already had their bye week, so they didn't quite finish all of their non-region games. They will play Malden next week. Good chance that the Cavaliers can win two in a row next week because Malden's just frankly not very good at all. All right, so that wraps up all of 5A this week as Gaffney was on their bye week. Again, Gaffney will play Spartanburg next week at Viking Stadium. That should be a really good game there. But uh, let's look at the 4A level. Greer, they started region play with a nice win. They defeated Lawrence 49-7 to with a really nice night from Ladaney and Martin. Martin had 240 yards on 13 carries with three touchdowns. There's a good chance that Greer can go to 2-0 and in region play. Greer has played a really tough non-region schedule. That's why they're, they're, their record doesn't look really good right now. But the truth is, right now, Greer is a good enough team to where they can still come out and win this region by running the table. So they stand a good chance of going 2-0 and next week as they will host Eastside in their next region game. The Broom Centurions just absolutely keep on rolling along. But at this point, you had to uh, beg the question is whether or not this is the best Broom team since the one that won the state championship in 2004. Now, they totaled 378 yards of total offense last night. That is the least total offense they put up since they narrowly lost to Spartanburg. It's crazy to say that the 378 yards, almost 400 yards of total offense is a slightly down night for them. But when you look at the last couple of weeks, they've almost had 500 yards of total offense. One of them, they had over 500 yards. So Broom's just been absolutely rolling, and it's been because of, as we keep highlighting, Kamaje Brackett, Brandon, and Jalen McGill. KBB last night, 14-16 for 156 passing yards, 59 rushing yards with 11 carries. J-Mac, 152 yards, two touchdowns on 17 carries. And then you had three different receivers for, Bur- or for Broom. The significant double figures put up. Treshawn Suber had 49 yards, Xavier Hill had 47, and Grayson Bradley with 36. Question for Broom going forward. All of this looks like it's shaping up to where Broom and Chapman are going to collide for the region championship later on down the road. The question mark in this is, obviously with Broom, Jalen McGill and Kamaje Brackett Brandon can't necessarily do everything for them every single week. They're going to have to have somebody else step up into the fold. They've clearly got other athletes that are capable of helping to do that. Kamaje Brackett Brandon is more than capable of getting the ball out there to any one of his athletes that are out on that field. The question is, who's it going to be? It's going to be interesting to see that question answered going forward. But Broom next week will continue region play. Probably will have put up another lopsided number next week. I wouldn't be surprised if they have over 500 yards of total offense again, simply because they're playing Blue Ridge, and this is the worst Blue Ridge team I've ever seen in my lifetime. Which for the record, is a 33-year sample size. <laughs> but uh, Chapman opened up region play strong last night. Speaking of uh, hanging lopsided numbers, they shut out Carolina 57 to nothing. 
not much to highlight here, so I'll just go ahead and move on for what Chapman's got coming up next week. The Panthers will take on nobody next week. They'll be on their bye week. And in two weeks, they'll pick it back up with Traveler's Rest. Good chance they can hang another lopsided number there. And again, everything seems to be pointing to another showdown at the end of the season between Chapman and Broom for the region championship. Elsewhere in the 3A ranks, Union County fell to Clinton 51-28, to and Woodruff dropped their region opener 44-6 to to Chester. Union will take on Chester next week, while Woodruff will go on the road with a good chance to get their first region win against Emerald. That'll do it for week six in the deadline, South Carolina Upstate High School football. We'll see you next week.